Welcome back, everybody. This is Professor Paul Hicks, and we're going to talk philosophy again. Um, today, I want to talk about a paper by Marilyn Fry on oppression. What exactly is oppression, uh, and do women suffer oppression, and how is it that they actually suffer oppression? And so we want to go ahead, and Fry wants to distinguish between, say, somebody just suffering or a certain group suffering, and what oppression really means. So what re is the real meaning of oppression itself? Um, so we're told, you know, that women are oppressed. This is rather fundamental to feminism itself, isn't it? So what is this word oppression, and how is it that women are oppressed? Um, Fry thinks that the way we're starting to use the word oppression is to stretch it so thinly that it begins to actually lose its meaning. So it's said, for example, that those who are oppressing are actually oppressed themselves because they're doing the oppressing. That is, they can't get out of the being oppressors themselves. And that by being the oppressor, that makes them actually oppressed. This is a bunch of nonsense, of course. Um, and Fry is right to point that out. You know, men are, for example, uh, when they take this line of thought, they say that they're oppressed just like women are because patriarchy is oppressive, that men aren't, for example, supposed to cry, that men always have to be tough, that men have to fight when called to, right? And we're told that, you know, it's rather tough to be tough. You know, it's, this, it's thought that any kind of suffering here um, in the human experience is oppression. But for Fry, we're stretching this beyond uh, meaningfulness here. So to say that men are oppressed by patriarchy is to really say that they lack feeling or emotion. And women who imply this are just being insensitive. Now this is really important because sensitivity is considered a virtue for a woman. So that if a woman is considered to be insensitive, she's not being a real woman. But the problem is, is that this view of oppression is mistaken. Oppression is not any form of human suffering. We can deny that a group is oppressed without denying that they suffer. So what is oppression? What does it mean? Well, let's go ahead and think of the root of oppression. Marilyn Fry says, the root of the word oppression is the element press, the press of the crowd, pressed into military service, to press a pair of pants, a printing press, Press the button. Presses are used to mold things or flatten them or reduce them in bulk, sometimes to reduce them by squeezing out the gases or liquids in them. Something pressed is something caught between uh, or among forces and barriers which are so related to each other that jointly they restrain, restrict, or prevent the thing's motion or mobility. To mold, immobilize, reduce. This is what oppression actually is. And one of the features, according to Marilyn Fry, of oppression, if a group is oppressed, is they suffer what's called the double bind. So Fry defines the double bind as follows. She says, the mundane experience of the oppressed provides another clue. One of the most characteristic and ubiquitous features of the world as experienced by oppressed people is the double bind. Situations in which actions are reduced to a very few, and all of them expose one to penalty, censure, or deprivation. For example, it is often a requirement among, upon oppressed people that we smile and be cheerful. If we comply, we signal our docility and our acquiescence in our situation. We need not then be taken note of. We acquiesce in being made invisible in our occupying no space. We participate in our own erasure. On the other hand, anything but the sunniest countenance exposes us to being perceived as mean, bitter, angry, dangerous. This means at the least that we may be found difficult or unpleasant to work with, which is enough to cost one's, one's livelihood. At worst, being seen as mean, bitter, angry, or dangerous has been known to result in rape, arrest, beating, and murder. So one can only choose to risk one's preferred form and rate of annihilation. So what do we really mean here by this double bind that Marilyn Fry is talking about? You can look at it as this sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't type of choice that people who are oppressed have to make. And the problem is either way they choose, they're going to get some sort of negative consequence. And because they made the choice, the dominant society looks at them and said, well, you made the choice and deserve those consequences. 
So let's give some examples here about how women are actually in the double bind. Women are in a double bind in numerous ways, according to Fry. So for example, women can work inside the home or not. Well, let's say um, they do go to work. Then what, are, what, what do we tell women? You abandon your children. You abandon your family. You're not a very good mother. Now, if they stay at help, then we say you're helpless and dependent. You need to be taken care of by a man or you're part of a welfare system. You are uh, a parasite onto society. We also put women into a double bind with how they dress. If they dress sexy, they're advertising their sexual availability. If they don't, then they don't care about their appearance and they're actually on feminine. We put women in a double bind when it comes to the use of language. If they use strong language, they're not ladylike. And if they don't, they are too delicately structured to deal with such robust speech, you know, because women simply can't hear those naughty, naughty words. Um, another way of a double bind with women is to get married or don't. If they do get married, well, then they're, now they're dependent upon a man. And if they don't get married, must be a lesbian, which in and of itself can uh, lead to rape or murder and violence. Another double bind women find themselves in is to have children or not. If they have children, then they're part of economic binds and household binds. If they don't, why, why are you such a bad woman for not liking children? What's wrong with you? All right? Other binds, are you sexually active or not? If she is heterosexually active, a woman's going to be open to censure and punishment for being loose, they're unprincipled, they might be called a whore. The punishment comes in the form of criticism, snide and embarrassing remarks, being treated as an easy lay by men, scorned from the more restrained female friends. She may have to lie to hide her behavior from her parents. She must juggle the risks of unwanted pregnancy and dangerous contraceptives. If she's raped, she's seen as liking sex, and therefore she really wanted it. Right? She was asking for it. Uh, on the other hand, of course, if she refrains from heterosexual activity, she's fairly constantly harassed by men who try to persuade her into it, pressure her into it, to pressure her to relax, let your hair down. She's threatened with labels like frigid, uptight, you're a man-hater, what a bitch, you're a cock tease. The same parents who would be disapproving of her sexual activity now may be worried by her inactivity because it suggests she's not or will not be popular uh, she's not sexually normal. She may be charged with being a lesbian, which, of course, is, you know, can lead to real negative consequences. Now, if she's not sexually active she's, and she's raped, now it's seen as that, well, she was repressed and frustrated, and it was really for her own good. So if she's sexually active and she gets raped, well, she likes sex, right? She really wanted it. Uh, if she's not sexually active and she gets raped, she was repressed and frustrated and really needed it. So you see, either way women choose, either way women act, negative consequences follow, and they don't have control over that. So, right, if one is sexually active and raped, she wanted it. And if she was not, it was for her own good. So what we find here is that both heterosexual activity and heterosexual non-activity are likely to be taken as proof that you wanted to be raped, and hence, of course, weren't really raped at all. You can't win here. You're caught in a bind. You're caught between systematically related pressures. So uh, she gives the analogy of a birdcage here. So if you want to look at oppression, you should think of oppression as a birdcage. Now, if you examine a cage too closely, all you're going to see is one barrier. That is, you're going to see one wire of the actual cage. It seems as if this barrier is really no big deal. And if you're only looking at one maybe double bind or you're only looking at one way somebody's oppressed, you know, you can't see, well, hey, that's no big deal. Just go around it and, you know, go live your life, right? Um, it would seem as if the barrier is no big deal and that to complain about it is just going to make you sound like you're whiny or you're bitchy. But if seen as a whole, that is, you look at the entire cage, you pull back a bit, then you're going to actually see several wires. That is, you're going to see a network of systematically related barriers. Now, when taken together, they create a solid wall that restrains the bird. All right, so the bird's not restrained by one wire, they're restrained by a lot. And likewise, with oppression, 
it's not just one way of being oppressed. People who are oppressed are oppressed in so many different ways that it uh, constrains them and presses them into a particular situation. So let's think of, for example, uh, chivalrous acts and how we think of oppression in the mind uh, with, about women. So let's just think of a real simple chivalrous act. That is, a man opens the door for a woman. Now, this seems like an act of helpfulness, doesn't it? How could this possibly be offensive? Well, the helpfulness here is actually false. It's not done out of any sort of practical sense. You know, for example, um, infirm men or men with packages will still open doors for women who are able-bodied and free of any sort of physical burdens. So the sort of help here is really useless. According to Fry, what women experience is a world in which gallant Prince Charmings commonly make a fuss about being helpful and providing small services when help and services are of little or no use, but in which they are rarely ingenious and adorate princesses at hand when substantial assistance is really wanted either in mundane affairs or in situations of threat, assault, or terror. There's no help with his laundry, no help typing a report at 4 a.m., no help in mediating disputes among relatives or children. There's nothing but advice that women should just stay indoors after dark, be chaperoned by a man, or when it comes down to it, just lie back and enjoy it. Right? If we look at this act um, by looking at the individual man's conscious intentions, we're looking at it too small of a scale. So just because a man's not thinking when they open a door for a woman, I am oppressing this woman, he's probably not thinking that. But what is happening by opening doors for women? What is it saying about women? According to Fry, it says that women are incapable of doing it themselves. See, practically no one, I'm see, one opens a door for somebody who can't do it by themselves, right? We, we help people who maybe are disabled or who have a lot of packages or something. There's something they can't do. So to do it for women is to really see them as incapable of doing it for themselves, to put them down, is to see them as less capable or less than, uh, but somehow dependent upon men. So for Fry, feminists should be against this type of chivalry because when we allow this type of chivalry, what does it really say about how society views women? What is actually expected here? And what it seems to say is that women are really dependent upon men. And if feminism wants to get past that, as I think we ought to, then we need to get past those kind of chivalrous acts themselves, right? The message of false help is false helplessness of male gallantry is female dependence, the invisibility, the insignificance of women and its contempt for women. This is what happens with chivalry. And it's not, just say something helpful. It's actually saying something very negative and doing something very negative. All right, so that's Marilyn Fry's view of oppression. Uh, please feel free to leave any comments and I will talk to you next time. Bye.